This episode is made possible by the generosity of our listeners. Thank you. Welcome to the Creation Science for, for Kids. Kids show. We've already learned about horticulture, gardening, taxonomy, naming creatures, and several other sciences. Today, we get to learn about medicine. We have a look at God performing the first surgery and what he did for Adam's safety and comfort. Then we'll hear a parable about natural selection and finish up with a trip to meet one of the most fearsome predators in the swamp. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. Psalm 111 verses 1 through 4. This is episode 53 of the podcast where we learn about Jesus, our creator in his amazing world. Hi. I'm Sherry Fields, your host, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Timothy. Hi. And Stephen. Hi. To follow along with what we're looking at, check out the show notes, creationscienceandnumberforkids.com slash surgery. Oh, yes. Be sure to stick around to the end to hear from another young science lover. All right. Today, we're back in Genesis. We're in chapter two, and we've gotten up to verse 21. Would you read it for us, please, Timothy? And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Thank you. What is happening here? Do you remember in the verses earlier, the Lord God had said, it's not good for Adam to be alone. We're going to make him a help that is appropriate for him. And then he brought all the animals for Adam to name, but none of them was the right kind of assistant for Adam. So now what is God going to do? You know what he's going to make. A woman. A woman. Right. So how does he do it? Hmm? I don't know. He made Adam sleep. Mm-hmm. And it took one of his ribs and formed it into a woman. Right. He's going to make a woman out of his body. There's a bunch of cool things here. First of all, some people used to think that every man had one less rib than women. Does that make sense? No. No, because the seed that Adam's sons and daughters came from, did it know he would had surgery and had a rib removed? If your dad loses his arm before you were born... Does that mean you won't have an arm? No. No. If you get all your teeth knocked out, will your babies? Well, they won't have any teeth showing right at first, but will they never grow teeth? Of course not. So that idea was just silly and they weren't thinking very clearly, but it's kind of romantic to think of. Next time we'll talk more about why God needed to use a piece of Adam's body to make woman. But today we're going to be looking at what God did to get that piece of Adam's body out of him. He could have just done a miracle and pulled it out, but he didn't. He made Adam fall asleep. And look, it doesn't just say sleep. It says deep sleep. A deep sleep. That tells us that it's not just a light snooze. It tells us something about what God did. He wanted Adam to really, really be knocked out. What do we call it when we use that now in medicine when we're going to remove or work on part of the inside of a person? Do you know? Melatonin. (laughs) That helps you fall asleep if you have trouble because your body's supposed to make melatonin every night. No, doctors do not use melatonin to help people when they're going to do surgery. It's called anesthesia. And it actually means a way of taking away the pain. Most of the time we do that by making a person fall asleep. It's the easiest thing to do. And it works amazingly well. You can go through open heart surgery and not remember and then start your recovery pretty quickly. So I wanted to see, even before sin, what would have happened if God hadn't made Adam fall asleep? What if God had just said, hey, Adam, stand still. I'm going to do something. And he goes, rip, takes out the rib and then closes it up. 
What would have happened to Adam? Uh... How would you feel if Daddy said, hold still, and he gets out a knife and goes at your rib? I would... He would run away. <laughs> yeah, you would be scared silly, wouldn't you? Uh-huh. Yeah, it would have been terrifying, even if you trust... God, as Adam at this point had no reason not to, it would have still been extremely scary. Plus, I looked up an article and for some reason I was able to see it. Nursingtimes.net released this huge long paper full of all kinds of big words I barely understood. And now it turns out I have to have a subscription to look at it again. But it talked about at least 12 different Areas where if somebody's going through a huge amount of pain, it messes with your body. It messes with your tummy. It messes with your breathing. Think about it. Even if Adam had enough faith to trust God to hold still and let God do it, he was taking out his rib. If you had your rib wide open, would you want to keep breathing? No. No. And that's what happens when you're in a lot of pain, even if it's your toe that hurts. You stop breathing properly and you can go into something called shock. And it's really, really bad for your body. Just the pain itself is bad for your body. God knew that. And this tells us something fascinating about humans and life before sin. Adam, having never sinned, where he would have lived, been able to live forever if he'd obeyed God, still needed to be put to, in a deep sleep for surgery to happen. God knew all that, so he made sure Adam was comfortable. He didn't have to experience all that trauma. I was actually talking to a psychiatrist and said, do you know anything about what pain does? And he said, well, for one thing, he could have gotten PTSD, which is what happens to soldiers and other people who've been through terrifying experiences where they can't sleep and they have a lot of trouble for years after. Adam could have experienced that even trusting God. It would have been so scary. He could have had nightmares. So God loves us. He cared about Adam, and although we'll see next time, or next time we're in Genesis, why he had to take it out of Adam's body in order to make woman, but he still cared about Adam's comfort. So he used anesthesia and gave him surgery. Okay, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. I bet it didn't take weeks. What do we do when we're doing surgery now? We have anesthesia. It has a lot of side effects. And when you wake up, you feel horrible. And how do we close up the flesh after surgery? Do you know? Uh, you put in stitches. Stitches. They actually sew your body back together. Yeah. It's kind of terrifying. And it's a lot. It's not easy for doctors to learn to do that because it's just an awful thing to have to do. And sometimes now, like if you, um, get a cut like on your eyebrow or something and it's it won't heal properly on its own and they want to keep it closed they'll actually use glue but for major surgery like this was you would have to use some sort of thread to hold it together i'm sure god was able to just like put his hand across and have it just heal in front of him so when adam was all done you wonder if god left a little bit of a scar so when he looked down at his side, he could say, yep, that's right where Eve came from. I don't know. God doesn't tell us whether it left a scar or not, but it's kind of a, a romantic thing to think of. Now, last week, I was doing my article that I do on the off weeks. A lot of times I've been brushing off things that I had worked up years ago when nobody was reading and checking to make sure all the links work and and just making things nicer. But there was a topic that I've been thinking about for quite a long time, and it works particularly well being spoken out loud. And I thought it's important enough that I'm going to share one of my own articles with you rather than one from Answers in Genesis or something like that. So here's, can natural selection make anything? So first I start with the University of California in Berkeley says, natural selection is one of the basic mechanisms of evolution, along with mutation, migration, and genetic drift. And then I quote from Charles Darwin, his book On the Origin of Species. Do you know why that book On the Origin of Species is so important? Uh, no. Okay, this was published over 150 years ago, and it was a book that made the modern idea of evolution so popular. 
It transformed the way a lot of scientists looked at the world. Instead of everybody assuming God had created all the basic kinds, they said, "Oh, here's a way we don't need God. Things can just evolve by themselves." His book was the turning point from most scientists saying, "Well, of course God made everything, and let's figure out what he did." to, of course, everything made itself, and let's figure out how that happened. So, it's a very important book. And he said in chapter 3, But natural selection, as we shall hereafter see, is a power incessantly ready for action and is as immeasurably superior to man's feeble efforts as the works of nature are to those of art. I won't explain all those big words to you, but you can see he thinks natural selection is very powerful. Then I have a picture and it shows on the left three kinds of giraffes. Can you tell me how are they different? Two of them have long necks mm -hmm. and one of them is a bit like a cow. Right, with a with a short neck. Short neck, yes. And then in the second picture what does it show has happened? The two mm -hmm. giraffes with the long necks are happily eating the the leaves off the tree mm -hmm. and the short neck one is laying on the deck. Grounded. Right. And what do you can you tell from the tree? Why did it die? Because it's got a short neck and the leaves are up high. Right. It couldn't le reach the kind of food it wanted to eat. So yeah, that is natural selection in action. Does that kind of thing happen? No. Yes, it does. It happens quite a lot. Further down, I also have a picture showing some moths on a tree. It's a really cool drawing I found. Some of the moths, can you tell how many moths are in the picture? Millions. I see seven, but how many are easy to see? Two. 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 That's on the light. The, most of the moths are light colored and the bark is light colored and the two that you see are dark colored. On the second picture, you have a dark colored tree trunk with bark and there are still one, two, three, four, five, six, seven moths And how many are easy to see? Two. 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 This time, the ones that show up are the light-colored ones. So which ones are the birds going to eat? The light-colored ones. The ones? The dark-colored ones. The ones Hello. that don't blend in, that are easy to see. That happens all the time. Okay, so now let's go to my parable. Let's imagine it was finally time for the county youth fair For months, young people throughout the region had been hard at work thinking of new ideas to test, new skills to try, and new techniques to develop the abilities they already had. They carefully packed up the results of their best work and brought them to the submissions table at the Arts and Crafts Building. Over the next 24 hours, judges would come through, examining each entry and considering its quality, creativity, and the amount of care and labor it would have taken to produce it. Each young person secretly, or not so secretly, hoped to win a ribbon, perhaps even the coveted best of show blue rosette. When the time came for the unveiling, the waiting crowd of entrants and their families were in for a huge shock. We are pleased to announce the results of our careful deliberation. After great effort and infinite attention to detail, the judges are proud to present to you the winning entries. These will be kept for posterity in our hall of progress, each with their ribbon forever affixed to declare their superior excellence. Every one of these pieces is a treasure, but far more important than these stunning examples of natural processes gone right are the true winners. I present to you the champions, our judges. Following this eloquent speech, the MC raises a handful of blue rosettes and walks over to the panel of judges, seated with their eyes modestly, but smugly downcast. What do you think would happen next? Can you imagine how upset and heartbroken the youth and their families would be at the realization that the honor they had worked so hard to earn was going to the judges who made nothing? How would you feel if you'd worked hard to make something and then they said, we're going to keep it and we're giving the ribbon to the judge who decided it was nice? I would be like, this is a weird play. <laughs> yeah, it would be very, very weird, and wouldn't I it? I would think that they should work and try to do it themselves. <laughs> yes. Not yes. win it and not do anything. Right. So, in the real world, who made everything? God. God. And when they want to say that natural selection is what made things, they're taking away 
the honor that belongs to God, and giving it to a process that all it can do is say, "Here's how we describe whether th- organisms, whether creatures have survived or not," and saying, "That's the reason they're all here." Oh, great natural selection! That's just as weird as this judge. Okay, but just because they're giving too much credit to natural selection, does that mean it's not real? No. no. Now we already talked about how the moths, it's the ones that stand out that get eaten, the ones that blend in and are better camouflage, are likely to survive. And that even changes. These moths are particularly famous because for a while when the industrial revolution happened and they had a bunch of coal being used in factories, it made the cities filthy. Everything got covered in coal dust and the bark turned dark. So all of a sudden, instead of the light bark, like on the upper picture, favoring that the lighter colored moths would survive, suddenly the dark ones were more likely to survive and have lots of children. Then they started cleaning up the factories. Eventually, the bark on the trays was lighter. And all of a sudden, you had the population shifted again and you had a lot more of the light ones were surviving. Did they have evolution where their genes actually changed? No. No. They already, and for that to happen so quickly, they already had to have that information in them. And it depended on the environment, which ones were more likely to have a bunch of babies. And that happens in all kinds of ways, whether it's the kind of food that's available to eat, be eaten, or like polar bears actually had some mutations turn off genes. So that's why they have the white fur and things like that. But it helps them to survive in the environment that they are in. It is real. And oh, one of the things that I found out, Charles Darwin was not the first to recognize natural selection has an important role in the variety of creatures we see alive today. 24 years before Darwin's book was published, a creationist had written a paper describing natural selection. Somebody who believed God had created still believed in natural selection. We do too. But natural selection is just a judge. In the same way you need a judge to figure out who will win a ribbon at the fair, natural selection is an important part of the process. But in the created world, natural selection isn't even as real as a judge at the fair is. It's just a term we use to describe what automatically happens in a fallen world where not everything survives to have children. At least the judges in my story had to use their brains to discover the best entries at the fair. Natural selection doesn't even know it's happening. So then I worked really hard to find a beautiful ribbon that we could give to God, the real champion of creation. Thank you, Jesus, for inventing, creating, and preserving the amazing creatures we see around us today. You are the one who deserves all the credit for your brilliance and hard work. Oh, yes, got to mention the bonus. If you remember, the U of C Berkeley page also said there were some other things that were in charge of evolution. So here's what else that MC said. Let's not forget our other amazing winners. There's Genetic Drift who pushed some of the entries onto the floor and broke them before our judges got to them. There's Gene Flow, that told different entries about the amazing secrets of other entries so they could copy them. And be sure to put your hands together for mutations who came in at night, snipped, broke, and jumbled to make random entries even more artistic than they originally were. What? (laughs) So that's dumber than the judges getting the ribbons. Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you a great, big, huge secret. Those are the only things secular scientists have to make evolution happen. Those four things are it. When they talk about adaptation and evolution, these four things are what they really mean. But they don't want you to find that out until you're in grad school. Now, it's time to hear from you. What do you have for us today, Timothy? Alligators. Ooh. Alligators are members of the crocodilian family, which are in the reptile family. Mm Mm-hmm. So what are the other members, crocodilians? That sounds almost exactly like? 
crocodile. Right. There are crocodiles and gharials, as well as the alligator subgroup. Uh huh. Like other reptiles, they're cold-blooded and they lay eggs.、Mm-hmm. And they've got scales.、Mm-hmm. When their tummy rumbles, yeah, it makes bubbles that can go two feet high. Oh wow! Okay, so this is an alligator that does that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever seen a video where they're doing that? Yeah, it's really cool. So, in order to make the bubbles, where do they have to be? In the water. Right. All alligators like to be in the water. Right, and then they can rumble deep in their throat, and it vibrates all along their body and makes these cool. Bubbles that pop up in the air. Yeah. What do they like to eat mostly? Fish. Yeah. Actually, most of the crocodile family—that's their primary diet. Even though the big ones can eat deer and cows and people and things. Okay.、Uh, where do they live? What parts of the world? They live in warm parts.、Mm-hmm. They live in Florida. Okay. Right. And that's the what we you normally think the normal alligators. Live in the southeastern United States, from Florida all the way over to Texas. Texas, along the Gulf Coast, there. Yes. And where is there? There's another alligator species, the one that's almost extinct in the wild, called the China alligator. Yeah. So where do they live? In China. China. Do you remember what the name of the river is? The Yangtze. Yeah. And how many are left in the wild? About a hundred and thirty China alligators are in the wild.、Mm-hmm. And how many are in zoos? About ten thousand. Right. Now, if you saw a Chinese alligator and an American alligator next to each other, what would you notice? They're different. How? Which one's bigger? The American alligator. Way bigger. The Chinese, a grown-up, is a little bit bigger than me. <laughs> yeah. They get up to about ninety pounds. I think it was forty kilograms, and about a meter and a half, if I remember. Yeah, so they're a lot smaller. Do you remember what's different? If you just saw pictures, an American alligator's head is fairly smooth for a crocodilian, but the Chinese alligator is bumpy. Yeah, and bony, and it's got more bony plates all around its body, including on its belly. Yeah, so they're working hard, but with all the people living in China and that it doesn't have many places where it can safely breed. At least for right now, they do. They don't mind having babies in zoos, so we're trying to keep enough of a population. And China is working to clear a preserve where they can be happy out in the wild, so we can have them around for a long time. Okay. Now there's another group that we don't call alligators that are still in the same subgroup of the crocodilians. What are those called? Caimans. Caimans. And where do they live? They live in South America and Central America. Right. Now this is a good point to、um, say. Do we believe that caimans, alligators, and crocodiles are related, like the evolutionists do? Yes. Yes, we do. Because they're so similar that it's easy to see how the genes could have been passed down from one crocodile ancestor that was on the ark and got off, and then their children spread out all different directions and got separated. So they only had a smaller set of the genes. Just like with people, we can look very different, but we still come from one family. So yes, we believe that the crocodilians are related. Just like the evolutionists, we just don't think crocodiles are related to dinosaurs and birds. The caimans are interesting. They come in all sizes too, from very small to quite large.、Um, what's the longest on an alligator? How long do they get to be? Get the、it? American alligator gets up to seven thirteen feet, which is how many meters? Four meters. Four meters. And the largest caiman, the black one, got up to seventeen feet. Seventeen feet. Yeah. So that was that's five meters long, but the tiny, the dwarf caiman, it was about the size of the Chinese. So that was something、yeah. different. Here we go. The spectacled caiman is six and a half feet, which is two meters. Right. So they come in quite a variety of sizes. All right.、Uh, we watched a cool video from National Geographic. What was it all about? It was about how mothers protect 
their eggs yeah. from predators. Mm-hmm. What do they have to do? Why? They have to stand guard because there's lots of animals that will take the eggs and crack them open and eat them. Yeah. Now, you guys were really upset at all the monkeys and the lizards and the jaguar and stuff that were coming to eat the eggs. Do we eat eggs? No. Yes, we yes, do. Yes, do. Oh, there's- yeah. So we know how scrumptious eggs are. Now, I wouldn't want a half-developed caiman egg, but a lot of animals think they're delicious. Oh, and then if they survive and they get out to the water, what else was eating them or was thinking about eating them? What was it? The giant otter. Right. And you like otters, don't you? But yeah. you you weren't happy with them trying to eat the baby caiman, were you? Yeah. Yeah. We'd much rather they ate a piranha. Yeah. Okay, now, there's something very, very interesting about their eggs. Did you read about what, how the alligators, and the caimans, um, turn into boys or girls? It's when the temperatures are warm mm-hmm. or cold. Do you though. remember which is which? The warmer it is, there are more boys, mm-hmm. and the colder it is, there are more girls. Right. And we saw that there's only a 4 degrees Celsius difference, so that's about 8 degrees um, Fahrenheit that it, you can have a mix. It needs a very stable nest environment. Now, that's something interesting. What's the difference in an alligator between a boy and a girl? Whether it produces the egg with all the food for the baby to grow in, or just the genetic information. There's very little else that changes. All the genes are there for both boys and girls have to be inside the egg for the temperature to determine it. So it's not like people where we have a whole different set of chromosomes to turn us into a boy or be a girl. Okay, what else is cool about alligators? Did you see that mama alligator? Why doesn't, why don't they just stay up on the ground next to their nest to keep all the marauding animals away. Oh, to get food. <laughs> yes. Timothy, did you see what was bothering that big, wise mama who knew to put her nest in the right place, but she still had to leave them to get down into the water? Oh, were- the flies. Flies, yeah, because it's hot and their skin, even though they've got the tough, leathery skin, it still hurts when the flies are bugging them. So that's part of why they get down into the water. Okay, so, oh, how do they swim? They swim with their tail. Mm -hmm. It's like they're a snake in the water. They don't swim with their feet. Right, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, they can still move pretty fast on land. If you're needing to get away from an angry alligator, you want to, um, don't run in a straight line. You want to zigzag away from them because they have trouble turning this way and that. But they can move pretty quickly. Okay. Anything else cool about them? When the eggs hatch, Mm -hmm. they will take them out and put them in their mouths and Mm -hmm. then carry them out to the water. Yeah. Um, Not all the time, but yes, sometimes a mama, and it shows on your cool book that you borrowed, she's got her mouth full of eggs and little hatchlings. The hatchlings are pretty cute, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Even something like that still has the big eyes and the smoother skin. What I th- thought was cool in the video, you could see all of them breathing. Where? In their throat. Yeah, their throat goes in and out when they breathe. Now, one of the things I know, if you ever have to deal with one, do you know how a man who's way smaller than a grown-up alligator can um, fight them and, and keep them from biting him? No. Alligators have very strong muscles to close around their fish or prey, but they do not have strong muscles to open them up again. So if you can get their mouth closed, even somebody okay. fairly weak can hold them closed. Like you can lasso their mouth when mm-hmm. it's closed right. and then just yeah. keep and then tie it around the So you tree still have to be careful. But yeah, that's what they do is they get their mouth closed and then they can't open it again. Thank you, Timothy. Okay. I ran into something interesting about alligators. Do you know what you call a group of them? No. A congregation. Just like humans. Yeah, like they're at church. Oh, and here's our joke for the day. What do you call an alligator in a vest? 
I don't know. An investigator. <laughs> don't forget, you can find the links to all the things we've talked about today by visiting our show notes page, creation science, the number four kids dot com slash surgery or slash zero five three for episode fifty three. While you're there, I'd like to ask for your help. If you know someone who might enjoy listening to this podcast and checking out my website, would you let them know for us? Every article I do, including today's show notes, has share buttons to make it super easy for you to pass on to your friends on Facebook or by email. You have amazing power to help your friends find out the truth with just a click of a button. Plus, if you want to encourage us leaving the show, a rating on iTunes is a great way to do that and help families looking for new podcasts to find us. Thanks. I am so excited to share this next bit. Sam's message made my day, and I think it will yours too. Let's listen. Hi, my name is Sam and I live in Ipswich in England. I like listening to podcasts about creation because I want to learn more about the Bible and lots of books are just about evolution. I like science, for example, atoms in space. So Sam is just nine years old. What do you think about it? Adam! Why? Because he likes creation. Mm -hmm. Does he live around the corner from us? No. No, how can you tell? Because he's got a cool accent. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure Sam thinks you have a cool accent, too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. As you can hear, your message doesn't have to be very long. If you want, I can even edit it to help you sound good, too. So... Do you like science? Got a subject you want to learn about? Or maybe you like telling stories? Remember, it's super easy to turn your smartphone into a recorder. And if you send me a report, story, joke, or interesting idea, I might use it in a future show. Head over to creationsciencethenumber4kids.com slash podcast to find out what to do. Well, this finishes up our show oh. for today. Until next time, have fun in treasuring our amazing universe and creator. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4.11 Revelation 4.11